So ideas, whether they are in literature, in music, in one of these tabloids you see out there, imagine you're like the press driving home and there is this big sign on the highway, Jesus lives. And you don't really care about Jesus. You don't really care about the New Testament. You don't care about God or religion. But man, you're just down and out. And you say, let me call this number just to make fun of them because no one can really understand my solitude. No one can understand my depression. And you call and there is this man or this woman who says, yes, let me guess, your name is Joaquin. Wait, and you look at your cell phone and say, did I just mistake you to call my mom? No, some stranger. You've called just to harass me, but here's the thing. I'm going to harass you because you're in the right place. And all of a sudden, the tabloid becomes a piece of, piece of art. So you can't, first of all, <clears throat> you have to broaden your definition of what the work of art is because it could be anything. But you have to define art as something that educates you, makes you think, makes you reflect, makes you more aware, more mature, okay? Now, why do we create art? Two reasons. First, when you create art, when you go home and you write in your journal, you yearn long, are desperate to see your own reflection. You want to understand your depression. You want to understand why your mom is the way she is. You want to understand why your friends are the way they are. Okay? So you see yourself in your journal. That's a work of art. That's a mirror. It's no longer like a piece of paper and ink on it. It is a mirror, man. And especially like when you fall in love with someone, you send them a love note. And then she'll call you and says, you know, I got your letter. And this is when we actually used to write letters, not emails or texts. There are some like spots that, are, that look like they were wet. Were you crying as you were writing this letter? And you say, yeah, yeah. And it's no longer a piece of paper, man. It's a testimony. It's a work of art that has so much emotion in it, you know. So whenever someone creates something, first they do it for themselves because there is something inside them <coughs> that's about to burst. And if they have some fame or if they have a number of friends, then they say, you know, like my brother called me this morning. He was on his way to Sac State to teach a couple of classes. And he said, so what's going on? I said, Amir, I sent you one of my lectures. Why would I say that thing? Because I want to live inside my brother. I want him to listen to me, to my work of art. And then I want him to tell me what he got from this work of art. Now, a couple of things will happen. He'll say, Amir, you know, from minute one to minute five, it was good. But then, man, it, I got lost. It sucked. First, he inspires me. Then he depresses me. So the next part is you push your work of art out there to the public. And the moment you publicize it, you have two positive comments and a thousand negative. And you better trust what you're doing. Otherwise, the public will crush your work of art. Let me give you another example. Picasso some years ago was sitting and drinking his cup of coffee from Pete's, dark roast, French, that he got from a five-pound bag, okay? He was sitting and eating his bagel and cream cheese and pushing them down with his coffee. And as he's reading the, this newspaper, he realizes that the Nazis have bombarded this tiny little village. Number of dead, five million. I'm exaggerating, but nevertheless. Artists are very, very, very sensitive. Not only are they sensitive to their own dilemma, their own pain, they are what we call empaths. They have this ability to put themselves in the shoes of others, to feel for them, but not to talk to them, not to remedy them, 
to feel their pain so they can go home and write, so they can go home and paint, so they can go home and play music. Okay? <coughs> and so after hearing or reading this in the papers, he just gets really, really sad and depressed. He can no longer drink his coffee, eat his bagel. He goes to his room, grabs a pencil and a piece of paper and draws what they call Guernica. And when you look at this sketch very, very closely, I mean, it's dark, it's gloomy. And the message is, how could human beings do this to one another? Ultimately, <sighs> that's what work of art is. It's not there to make money. I mean, if you make money, fine, that's okay. You know, but you're not going to be like Jay-Z and all those people. Her and a Hurricane Katrina hits, you make a t-shirt, you put some art on it, and you sell it to the people. People who don't even have money to buy toilet paper. There is nothing wrong with being Snoop Dogg, man, if you just want to be Snoop Dogg in the privacy of your own home. But when you come on national TV and you're high, and there are like 10-year-old kids watching, when you know that you're African-American, there's also already a stereotype definition of what it means to be African-American, what it means to be Persian, what it means to be Mexican. You want to kind of go against that stereotype. Yeah, yeah. Neon? Uh, I feel like if we already have, like, this kind of thing, why don't we try and try so hard to, like, so, like, see things that are making it better, like, why would we, like, 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 Okay. Okay. A couple of things. Let me ask you a question. Do you drive? Imagine you're trying to get yourself to Pete's Coffee or this class, and uh, you're on Lakeshore, and you know the road is open, it's empty. There's only one car in front of you, and the car is going 15 miles an hour, and the speed limit is 35, maybe 40. Will you assume who the driver is? What is it? Old person, like what kind of old person? Is it old person Persian? Is it old person Caucasian? Is it old person Asian? Is it old person Indian? What kind of old person? Do you have any guesses? That's okay, I understand. Uh, you're a decent man for not, for not putting someone in a certain category. But if you have had some experiences on the road, there's a good chance that you will categorize who the driver may be. You may be wrong, but you also may be quite correct. The first thing you need to understand is we have a tendency of organizing things. That's what we do as human beings. You have a drawer for your underwear, you have a drawer for your socks, you have a drawer for your t-shirt, you have a drawer for this, you have a drawer for that. That's what we do as human beings. Look at your house. There's a bathroom, there's a living room, there's a guest room, there's a bedroom. Everything we do in life, we put them in different drawers. That's what we do. If I have never seen a white person, when I first came to America, I had never seen people with yellow hair. Never. So when I open the curtains and I see blondes, I go to my hand and say, their hair is, is yellow. What is that? I've never seen it. Number one. So stereotype is very natural to us. Do not be deceived by modern philosophies that get rid of the stereotypes. 
Okay? Let's just live harmoniously in a pot of soup and we can coexist. It won't work. Not like that. Okay. Remember, Neon, the stuff, the question that you're asking, it's been around for a long, 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 long time. Racism, slavery, it's nothing new. They've been around history, and by history, I mean the moment they were able to create language in a written form, that's when history came about. Go back in time, 5,000 years, there's slavery. Go back to Genesis, the Pharaoh has enslaved the Hebrews. They don't, he just doesn't like them. <coughs> okay, so it's nothing new. So the second question you need to ask is, why is it that some people exercise power over others? It's nothing new. It's been around for a long, long, long time. The question is why? Do not again be deceived by popular philosophies. Second, I mean, that's the second part that you need to focus. So it's first, remember, we put things in boxes. It's what we do as human beings. Second, we like to exercise power over other people. Comes natural. Third, we are all a product of our circumstances. <clears throat> I didn't ask for those parents. I didn't ask to be born in Iran. I didn't ask to be born in the 20th century. This is who I am. You didn't ask to be born African American. This is who you are. Now, Perhaps the other question is, <coughs> if you know human nature well, put your hand down for a minute. <coughs> if you know human nature well, okay? If you know what we do as human beings and how we function, the question is, well, how should you live then? How should you be? How should you behave? Let me give you a very, very simple way of looking at this. Imagine you're thirsty and it's two in the morning. You're really, really thirsty, man. And you have a long drive ahead of you. And you pull into 7-Eleven. And you see five or six guys smoking. They have a baseball bat in their hand. What are you going to do? You're going to be what? The Christian freak. They're going to be nice and kind to me. They're probably harmless. There's a good chance what you'll do is you say, this is not the safest place to be, perhaps. It's two in the morning. There's no one around. There's hardly any light. I'm thirsty. But those people look a little scary. Are you categorizing them? Absolutely. Are you demonizing them? Definitely. They may be all saints. Maybe they have baseball bats because they've seen a few lines and they want to protect the customers to go in. But that's not the way you think. So you know what you do? You back out, you pull into a different 7-Eleven. Forget this class. Forget we have an Asian, we have a Persian, we have someone who's 30, we have someone who's 60, we have women, we have men. Forget all that stuff. The question is, how do you want to be? You know, you can have a PhD, Neon. You could be directing NASA. But if you come here to visit your mom and go to Safeway, people will look at you funny. If you go to Safewell, someone will probably follow you, making sure that you're not stealing anything. All of us are condemned. We're all going to find ourselves in situations that are, to some extent, unpleasant. That's just life. But the bigger question is knowing what you know. Knowing what you know. How do you want to dress? How are you going to use language? How are you going to pronounce words? You see me? 
When I go to Roseville, which is about 90% white, and because most of them are Republicans, they haven't been exposed to diversity. I have an image on my head, and I didn't create this image. I look like a potential terrorist. I know that. But you think I'm going to what? Fight every goddamn person in Roseville who looks at me weird? No. So you know what I do? I dress well, but not for other people. I dress well because I truly believe that you have an obligation towards yourself and other human beings. Inspire people towards beauty. Dress well. Smell well. Speak well. You know why you like this class, Neon? Because I use language to reveal to you the sort of things you feel but can't explain. That's beautiful, man. That will inspire you to go read books, to think thoughts, so that when your companion asks you a question, how are you feeling, you say, you know, <coughs> I went to class, this guy made me think. And you know, thinking is a painful process because it pushes you into this dark mystery. And you got to figure things out, and it's dark, and there is no light. And your companion says, wow, that's, you know, that's very true. And then next time she, she has a question or an issue, she says, Neon, you know, I just, I just woke up angry. What is it? Say, honey, you know, I went to this class and we talked about moods. So let me tell you what moods are. And what happens if you're not careful, moods can morph into feelings. And if you're not careful, moods can turn into feelings and feelings turn into an emotion. And an emotion can stay with you for an entire day. And I want to go to Santa Cruz with you. I want to have a good time. So let's understand moods, making sure it doesn't morph into feelings. So we can go there and have a great time at Santa Cruz. And you know what's going to happen? Your companion, whenever she has issues, she's not going to go to another. She's going to come to you. And you know what's that going to do to your relationship? It's going to make it stronger, man. You will be the only ears she'll speak to. And she'll be the only ears you'll speak to. Why? Words make your mind beautiful because you're able to think. And then you express yourself like a work of art. I am a potential terrorist, but I dress well, and I speak well, and I think really, really well. And I don't say it because I'm arrogant. I say it because I know what I am good at, and I know what I'm not good at. You're not going to change my ideas about what it means to be black or white or blue or yellow. I have my set ways. Prove me otherwise. Don't ask me to change. I can't. If you prove me otherwise, what you'll do is you'll force me into doubting my position. You can put your fist to my face. I understand that. But you could ask. You could be in a certain way where I say, wait a minute. Maybe I was mistaken. Have you seen the movie Crash? You know, one of the nice things about the movie, I mean, it, it goes to all sorts of different areas of the human condition. But at the beginning of the movie, so you have two cops stopping an SUV. <coughs> the driver happens to be black. His wife happens to be black. And this, this cop, man, this white cop, after questioning this, this black man, he goes to the woman and he feels her with, her, with his hands. She goes to places that only her husband should go. And this other white police, they're both white, the officers. And this white officer just cringes. He can't believe what he's seeing. But he can't do anything. He doesn't have seniority. Cop number one puts his hand into this woman's skirt and feels her. Time passes in the movie. The same woman now, her, 
car is turned over, catches fire. Who's on the scene? A cop. Which cop? The very cop who felt her at the very beginning of the show, of the movie. She's far too traumatized to see what's going on. So as this cop goes into this burning car, she's screaming. She says, help. She's stuck because she can't open the be- uh, seat belt. She looks over and she sees this man and she recognizes him. And she says, no, get away from me. And what she's saying, I'd rather die t- than to be rescued by you. See, at the beginning of this movie, this cop who wears the suit that embodies justice, fairness. I am governed by law and law is blind. I will treat everyone equally. At the beginning of the movie, he had fallen from grace. He was a cop, but he was corrupt. He was far too human. Then he sees a woman in distress. He's a cop, but not a human. He's a cop whose purpose is to save lives, protect lives. And that's a sacred duty for any cop. But that comes to the surface when the human part goes down and the sacred part comes up. He risks his own life. He goes in this flaming car. What the driver, this woman trapped, doesn't see is she still sees him as the human. She doesn't see the sacred part in him. She still says, get away from me. And he says to her, please, please, I'm sorry, let me just help you. And there is something about him that has been transformed. And it's something that she feels, something she recognizes, and she submits. She says, okay, this is what happens when you feel something, man, that the person that invaded your personal space, harassed you, abused you, this person is gone, replaced by someone completely different. If at the very beginning of the movie, this was Thomas Anderson, this was Satan, now he's been transformed to Jesus Christ. Why? Flames, a woman trapped, she's going to be burnt alive. And that does something to him. Not so much as a cop, as a human being who has the power to rescue. And then she's rescued. And as the paramedics are helping her to the ambulance, she turns around. She looks at him and he looks at her. And it's a beautiful transforming scene. He knows she no longer sees, she no longer sees a cop who's abusive, but a cop who's an angel. And he no longer sees a woman who just is composed of body parts, but a woman who has emotions and doesn't want to die with her hopes and dreams unrealized. Do you see where this is going? Go ahead, Neon. Um, so, I guess how I interpret it is going to be a real time thing. I feel like going back to the example of So, you're saying that you dress up. For me, because first for me. For you, because you don't want to be seen as, or not that you don't want to be seen as a terrorist, but like someone can like, some be like a nicer look, so you don't better be looked at it as a terrorist anyway. Dress up nice, enjoy. Look, first of all, I'm not going to sit and talk to anybody just because they look at me. I ain't got time for that, man. First, I dress nice for myself. And I address that because I have a strange philosophy of beauty. I go to places and I buy statues. My house is like a museum. I like to be in the presence of beauty, as you do. 
You know, you make delicious coffees. Sometimes you engage in beautiful conversations and it inspires you and you like that about yourself. Will other people judge you, condemn you? Absolutely. Can you do something about it? No. Unless someone comes and says, listen, you know, I looked at you and I hate you. Can you help me not hate you? So, okay, if you're volunteering to be remedied, I'm going to tell you something that, um, take care. Thanks for the USBs. <coughs> You've heard of James Baldwin? He has this interesting way of dealing with the N-word. He says when someone, when I go out there and someone calls me the N-word, if you say that to Mike Tyson, they'll probably beat the crap out of you. If you say that to James Baldwin, something really interesting is going to happen. He's going to say, and that's what he said in many of his interviews, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to ask myself, what sort of a disease lives in this person who calls me the N-word? They must be really, really sick. They must be really uneducated. <clears throat> and I'm not going to take that burden. I'm not going to let this uneducated imbecile create emotions inside me that I don't want. Why do I need to be frustrated? Why do I need to be angry? It's his disease. I don't care for him. I don't even know him. He wants to call me the N-word? Let him stay sick. If someone comes to me and says, can you define to me, tell me, why people use the N-word? And if I feel that the person who's asking is curious, is sincere, then I will sit and give him the history, perhaps. See, you, you were here when we talked about Jean-Paul Sartre's play, No Exit, i.e. other people are hell. You dress with whatever way you want to dress, man. She's going to look at you and she's going to come to a conclusion. He's going to look at you. He's going to come to a conclusion. She's going to look at you. You have no choice in that. I mean, that, that's what happens when you live in society. First of all, look, if you don't mind, don't, don't say if they look at us this way. As I said, people are going to look at you and judge you. You don't have any power over that. Okay. I can come to class and act like a complete idiot. And have you guys walk out of the classroom and categorize me as a douchebag, as a buffoon? I can come to class and be a little bit more self-respected, more dignified, more mature. And you can go home and say, I have an instructor I really like, or maybe I relatively like, or he says interesting things. It's true, I have the power to be whatever. But ultimately, I want to leave a good impression. I care for these ideas. I like you to also care for these ideas. Because I think without these ideas, there are tools. If you don't have these tools, when your car or life breaks down, you can't put them back together, man. They're like wrench. They're like Dewalt toolboxes. They have all these different things in them. And you need them to make your life work. But if I act, behave badly, you're not going to listen to me. You're going to dismiss all the things that I say. Snoop Dogg has the microphone. Snoop Dogg has power. Snoop Dogg is a symbol. Snoop Dogg has power. Power in a culture that's slowly becoming more and more superficial, 
more and more hollow, more and more abusive. If you live in an environment that's dark, shed some light on it, man, be a flashlight. Everybody smokes these days, that's fine. You want to call on Jimmy Kimmel and talk about how beautiful it is to smoke? Good for you. Maybe one of your shows, talk about the benefits and harms of smoking. Be a symbol to a 10-year-old. Don't just encourage smoking, educate. You got a kid brother who's two or three or four, what, do you just go home and use profanities left and right? It's your life. Do whatever the hell you want to do, man. But you don't do that. You know why? You have common sense. You like your mom. You like your dad. You care for your brother. I'm not saying that they're not artists. They may be defined as artists in modern times. Not in my world, but in somebody else's. And that's fine. You know, <clears throat> sometimes they may even use great words, great messages. But for the most part, this, for me, it's trash. Does Oakland have great parts? Absolutely. But not in this area. I don't want to walk my kids around this area and have them hear words. Let me give you an example. About 10 years ago, I was walking the lake with my nephew. He had never heard of the N-word. Never. As I'm walking, this mother who is walking his or her, I don't know, two-year-old, who's just learning to walk. I don't know what was wrong with her. Maybe nothing, maybe everything. This kid wasn't keeping the pace. So she started screaming at this kid two years old, and she started using the N-word. I mean, I'm a parent, so that in itself was kind of traumatic for me. And then the burden placed on this two-year-old, having someone he cares and trusts screaming at her or him. And then I had the burden of going home, and while going home, my nephew asking, what does that word mean? The hell do I do now? Why do I need to have my nephew or niece exposed to that? And I'm not saying it's bad to be exposed. Be exposed, but in an environment where it's educational. See, right now we're talking about the N-word. I hope it's somewhat educational. I'm not using it casually. I'm not using it because it's fashionable. I'm not using it because it's entertaining. Because it has depth, it has meaning, there is pain in it, there is history in it. People have died for it. I don't want to walk around an environment where people just use this word casually, whether they want to use it in the context of being buddies, or they just want to be mean-spirited. People call me <coughs> camel jockey once in a while. What can I do? That's just the way the world works, man. Accept it. And then if you can, be different. If you think that Snoop Dogg and people, other people like him should just live their life, today you go home and use profanities in front of your kid brother. And when he asks you why, just say, it's my life. I'm an American, independent. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But you don't do that. You know why? Because you don't want your brother to turn to be five. And every other word is an F or an S. That makes you a better man than Snoop. Anyone else? My apologies for taking too much of your time. Have a great weekend. And uh, I'll see you Tuesday. Take good care. You too. Thank you. Nayon, thank you. That was great.